Dạ hai đứa sư. All right, great. We are recording. We will get going in a, in a few minutes. So hi, Tina. Nice to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Dave, just, we can hear you loud and clear. Great, great. So I won't be able to stay on for the whole call, but maybe just a few introductory remarks and uh, and then stay on as long as I can. I'm joining by phone, as you probably have already gathered. Perfect. Great. Glad you're here. Looks good, Wyatt. Okay, let me put it on. Uh... So we look like. Uh, okay. Hello, welcome to the town hall. We haven't started quite yet. We're getting set up. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll say this a couple of times, but uh, if you have questions or a couple of ways to ask your question, you can raise the your hand in MS Teams. There's you should have a, uh, I believe it's a reaction. Uh, icon at the top of your screen um, and that's how you can raise your hand and we will call on you. You can also if you would prefer that we um, if you're a little shy and you want us to read your question aloud, feel free to type it in the chat. Uh, you can also say in the chat. Hey, I have a question I'd like to ask um, you know about tax rates or something like that and we'll we'll call on you so that you can unmute and ask your question. So there will be lots of opportunity to ask your questions. Uh, just uh, sit tight. I think we're we're going to let maybe let a few more people roll in and uh, then we'll get started. So thank you all for joining us today. And we are recording this presentation, uh, so this will be available on YouTube and our website uh, a little bit later today. I think we're still waiting for one of our presenters to join. So, um, Wyatt, I don't know if you want to wait another minute or two for uh, Cindy to join us. Cindy's in a another meeting that I'm uh, aware of, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. We want to respect people's time, so it is uh, twelve o two. And uh, Susan, thank you for. Uh, facilitating and coordinating this meeting. For everyone who's on the call, Susan Fenarelli is the city's director of communications. And um, so our plan for today is, um, is uh, we'll share information uh, with you and then we'll open the floor for questions and comments. And as Susan indicated, this is recorded so that uh, people weren't able to join us at the noon time hour, uh, people can watch it later. Uh, before we do get started, I just want to note that uh, we have a number of city council members who are on the call and I'm um, seeing uh, council member uh, Phil Duncan and our mayor David Tarter. And before uh, we get started, let me turn it over to Mayor Tarter for a few welcoming remarks. All right, well, thank you, Wyatt. Um, I'm traveling at the moment, so I'm joining by phone, but I I wanted to participate uh, to the extent I'm able in this important town hall. And I wanted on behalf of my colleagues on council, A, to welcome you all and thank you for taking the time to be part of this discourse. Um, I know this has been a difficult few years for a lot of folks um, and the city is now pulling out of some challenging times. Uh, and I know that assessments have gone up quite a bit for a lot of folks um, and that that is painful. Uh, for a lot of people in our community. So I'm, I'm well aware of that. And I would start by saying, if you feel like your assessment has gone up beyond um, what the property is worth as of January 1, you are certainly welcome to make an appeal. And that information can be uh, found on the city website. 
But irrespective of that, um, uh, we're all cognizant on council of how much a bite property taxes take. Um, it has been challenging. Inflation is high. Uh, there's a lot of wage pressure right now. Um, and the workforce is in transition. So there's a lot of moving parts, particularly this year. Um, we do still need to support our schools and our strong city services. Um, and I think this the, the increase in market value is reflective of the overall market, but also reflective of the desirability of Falls Church. But nonetheless, we need to make sure we do all we can to keep that rate as low as possible for all the members of the community, but particularly those most vulnerable seniors and other uh, people who have challenging circumstances. Um, uh, the city manager has presented a budget that already provides a substantial decrease in the tax rate. Um, this is not enough to cover increases in assessments. I understand that we all do. And so that's part of the dialogue we're gonna be having uh, over the next weeks and that you'll be a part of. Um, so I wanted to say this is the start of this process, not the end. We all look forward to hearing from you and you're most welcome to participate, not just in town halls, but in city council meetings and private conversations with us on council. And I just, again, wanna thank everyone for, for their participation and interest. So why, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Mayor Tarter, and I really appreciate that introduction because I think it really sets the stage for um, a lot of the challenges, but but also, you know, some of the key features of, of the budget proposal that, that, uh, that I've submitted to the city council on Monday night. And um, as the mayor noted, this is the beginning of a process. We've got um, this town hall meeting, multiple public hearings, and um, and the council will be considering it over the month of April and, and um, is targeted for uh, final consideration in the final public hearing on May 2nd. Um, and as, as the mayor alluded to, this has been a very dynamic year for developing a budget for all the reasons that he stated. Uh, we've got um, uh, inflation that's happening on the on the expenditure side, a lot of wage pressure um, and the need to uh, uh, compensate and 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 um, and take care of our workforce, both with with compensation, but also making sure that they have the tools they need to be able to do the job and um, and a lot of other big areas of dynamism in terms of federal and state policy. The federal government is, uh, you know, provided ARPA funding last year, and so that's a part America Rescue Plan dollars. So that's a part of putting together the budget. And then uh, the General Assembly also uh, potentially has some good things, uh, but also some things that could be negative for the city and they haven't finished up their processes. Um, one other kind of key thing that I hope to communicate is is that with this budget, it is a time for us to try to address some of the challenges that we do have in the city. On one hand, we do have really transformative uh, opportunities with the grant dollars that I'll detail in just a moment. Uh, the economic development that it's happening in the city. Uh, we need to manage that economic development well. We need to manage these grant funded projects well. And at the same time, we need to take care of the basics, um, the, the fundamental core governmental services. Uh, we need to deliver those at the level that citizens expect. And we have, you know, through COVID, and through some of the challenges that we've had in terms of uh, workforce uh, changes, uh, some of that's been a big, big tension and challenge for the organization. And we tried to uh, take important steps to address that in this budget as well. So let me just check. Can you all see my screen? Because I'll go through a couple of slides now. Yes, and, we can. Uh, OK, very good. So. Um, let me also just by way of introduction, I've, I'm hoping that the slides that I have will take about 10 minutes. And if you'll bear with me on that to get information out to you, then I'd like to break for uh, questions and comments just on the, the slides that I've presented and, and some of the key things on revenues and on key priorities for funding. And then after that round of, of commentary and, and questions, I would like to introduce Cindy Mester, who's uh, leading our CIP process, and she can make a few comments about the capital improvements program because it is uh, there are a lot of really important projects in that that will impact um, our our community. And we have a brief video that's about six minutes long that explains the CIP quite nicely. And so towards the end of the the uh, 
you know, uh, this meeting, we'd like to show that video and, and get any commentary or questions from it as well. So with that introduction, then let me jump in and um, talk about some of the key things that we're trying to do with this year's budget. Uh, one, uh, the, the school board worked very hard to develop a, a school budget and this uh, the proposal uh, funds the school board's request. That focus on core government services, doing sort of the basic things well. It's an important area of deliberation and work that we've been trying to do in developing this uh, budget, and that includes enforcements and uh, investments in our workforce. There is uh, additional resources for public safety, uh, both police and importantly for building safety. We have a surge of building activity that's happening in the city um, and will be happening over the next three years, and we tried to make sure that that is staffed and resourced so that that is uh, managed well. We have big grants for transportation, walkability, and traffic calming projects. And we've been successful in, in um, getting grant dollars to help pay for flood mitigation and following through on the Stormwater Task Force recommendations on the big projects. Um, and we'll talk about that. As the mayor noted, uh, the budget is based on an eight and a half cent reduction in the real estate tax rate. Um, and as as I think we've both been saying, is that a lot of things, uh, a lot of uh, uncertainty in the environment right now. Even as we were developing this budget, things were changing rapidly. And so I've added into the budget a larger than usual contingency to give the council flexibility to address your comments and your concerns as we go through the budget process and also uh, to deal with some of the potentially to deal with some of the cost inflation that is still underway uh, on, on the spending side. So here's a, a slide that I hope you all can see the numbers and uh, that they're big enough to see, but kind of the, the, this is sort of the big wrap up slide. So the bottom line is the budget would be growing 7.6%, but that includes you know a lot of these grants that I've mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, the school transfer would grow 6.3%. The general government base budget would grow 6%. And we do have that contingency of a million dollars uh, and 20,000 uh, that is uh, shown here. Uh, we sustain a uh, $100,000 for affordable housing. We do have investments in fleet and uh, major equipment, which we do in, on a pay as you go basis. That's $550,000. I'll talk about our building permits. So building permits are generating revenues for the city and we're deploying those to make sure that the building safety functions are happening well for the big projects, but also so that if you come in with a small project like a kitchen remodel, that um, that you that we're able to administer that quickly and, and give uh, homeowners good service, even as these big projects are moving through the process as well. Uh, debt service is coming down in the coming year, and that's going to be a trend that we hope to sustain. Uh, for for a while, we've got a lot of debt on our books with the new high school, the new library, and the city hall project, and uh, and and um, so we're we're uh, pleased to see that decreasing, and it will for the next couple of years. And then capital reserves, uh, that's part of how we're uh, funding our debt service and our capital program. We have a slightly lower uh, reliance on that in uh, in the coming year. And then uh, lastly, I'll talk about how we're using the America Rescue Plan dollars in the budget as well. So here's just a quick overview of where the spending goes, where the operating budget goes. So 42% for the school board requests. Uh, debt service is 12% of the budget and the, and the largest share of that goes to schools. So overall between debt service and the school board's uh, operating budget, it's about half of uh, your local budget goes to schools. And then going around the horn, some of the other kind of key things uh, include public safety, which is police and fire. That's about 15%. Public works, which is all of our street maintenance and facilities maintenance and stormwater. Uh, that's uh, 6%. Rec and parks and libraries, 5%. Health and welfare, 4%. Uh, building permits and planning, uh, that's 4%. So that's just a, a kind of a pie chart with an overview. 
So I'll go through a few slides just on some of the, the key initiatives that are in the budget. Um, over the past year, we've created a, a full time um, director of emergency management, and we took that from the police department. That was a uniform police officer who is now doing that full time role. And we've also converted one of our members of our command staff to a civilian position to help with policy accreditation um, and implementing the use of force review committee recommendations. So uh, this budget now funds two additional police officers really to restore those two positions that were converted to civilian um, duties. And uh, so that allows us to make sure that we've got a school resource officer in the schools. It's a really key position for us and also to have additional focus on traffic, uh, traffic enforcement. On building safety, we've got uh, the West Falls project, which is about a million square feet of development that will be getting underway starting in April, so very soon. And the Broad and Washington project there at the corner of Broad and Washington, um, that's going to be under construction soon. So uh, we've got building permit fees that have come in to pay for resources that we need to make sure that that building happens safely and that uh, even as we're managing those big projects, you can still come in and walk if you've got a small project like a fence project or a, um, a commercial tenant fit out that those plan review times uh, will be reasonable. Uh, another key thing is uh, we'll use these dollars to make sure that these projects are being built correctly per the site plan, that the developers following all the construction management things that they committed to. You got to have people to make sure to enforce those things on, our, on a daily basis. So that'll be covered not by taxes, but by the building permits that are paid by developers themselves. Now I'm going to just list some of the major projects that we think are transformative for traffic calming and for pedestrian safety that are mostly grant funded and are which are going through the process right now and in this budget. So things that are in design right now is uh, on Park Avenue from the State Theater down to the library. Uh, we've got a grant to bury the utility wires and put in streetscape and, and uh, wider side, sidewalks. So that project's at about 30% design right now. And um, uh, so uh, look forward to engaging with people on that, potentially putting the farmer's market, say, on, on Park Avenue on, a, uh, on Saturdays. Um, there's a project also grant funded to create a safer walkway from the WNOD up to Meridian and Marion Ellen Henderson via Shreve, uh, Shreve Road in Fairfax County. That's a, a grant that the city, it's in Fairfax County, most of it, uh, but the city was able to get that grant to, to get that project forward. Um, other ones include uh, the Oak Street Bridge and on Lincoln Avenue, if you live on Lincoln Avenue, um, we've done a lot of water main replacement on that street along with uh, Grove and, and some other places, uh, but we do have a, a um, a project to engage with the community on for traffic calming as well as stormwater management all along Lincoln Avenue from west all the way down to the Arlington County line. That came about directly from uh, residents of Lincoln petitioning the city uh, to address both, both of those things and we're able to put some of the uh, uh, grant dollars we've received to that purpose. And then importantly uh, for sidewalks, missing links, uh, little gaps in our sidewalk net, uh, network, we've gotten grant dollars to, to fill in those grants and also uh, improve ADA compliance on our sidewalks and, and uh, you know, particularly uh, in our commercial districts, but throughout the city. Um, neighborhood traffic calming is funded with $100,000 of local dollars, but we can augment that also with uh, some of these grant dollars as well. Some projects that are uh, more advanced, those are all things that are in design, but uh, things that are moving forward include um, intersection improvements at North Washington and Columbia Street. Uh, we've got uh, Hawk signals planned for Broad Street in three locations uh, where people, you know, where there's not a stop signal for a long distance. We have a pedestrian activated signal so that people can cross the street safely. Uh, the WNOD crossings grant and uh, intersection improvements at Annandale and South Maple. That's what we call the roundabout project because it is currently conceived of and is, and is being designed as a, uh, not as a traffic signal, but as a roundabout at Annandale and South Maple. 
And of course, we're finishing up now the South Washington Street project that was grant funded. Um, and we're in the midst of doing the West Falls um, project improvements. The utility wires around the site are being undergrounded right now as we speak. And these grant dollars will be used to improve uh, student safety uh, walking to and from the site, but also some of the traffic signals that are needed on, on Broad Street and Haycock for that project. And then lastly, one that is just starting construction right now is, is a new signal, which would be at South Maple and South Washington Street, along with uh, uh, pedestrian crossings of South Washington Street. So part of our, our, our strategy has been to get dollars to parts of the city that have not seen them historically. And, uh, and importantly, the South Washington Street corridor is getting a lot of the improvements that Broad Street got uh, you know, 15 to 20 years ago. A couple other key thing investments in the area of, of uh, equity and inclusiveness. Uh, sort of when when we say that we're sort of referring to the city's vision and comprehensive plan, and so these are things that fit in within that whole kind of area of concern. Tax relief for seniors uh, that is currently funded at just over a penny on the tax rate, or five hundred thirty-five thousand dollars for people who qualify uh, for the city's tax relief program. I will note that that's funding it really just at the current policy level. And we will be talking with the city council about changing our policies and expanding potentially eligibility for tax relief. And if so, we'll use some of that contingency that was laid, laid out at the very beginning of this presentation to help pay for that. We've got funding uh, to help match some of the grants we've gotten for affordable housing. Um, and we're using some of the America Rescue Plan dollars to help with, with people who are uh, dealing with some of the, the, the most severe economic fallout from the pandemic um, using ARPA dollars. Next, uh, we'll talk about uh, preservation of small town character, also kind of one of these vision principles in the, in the comprehensive plan. Um, having a use of, of a portion of the hotel tax for downtown improvements, such as uh, the um, uh, keeping things clean in the downtown area, making sure that the uh, the sidewalks are are kept clean and and presentable, flower baskets and that type of thing. Uh, implementing our park improvements, um, business assistance using ARPA dollars, and we've also are, are trying to fortify our our office of the registrar of elections. There's been a lot of uh, law changes on on um, early voting and that type of thing which is more labor intensive and we absolutely need to do that correctly uh, for the uh, fair running of our elections here locally. Um, and I'll close on the on the on the spending side just by talking about uh, the kind of getting back to the basics over the past year. We did have uh, vacancies in uh, in the city, uh, notably in the police department where we were down about 25% below full staffing for a period like we're at, at our lowest point in September. We've since hired those positions back. Um, and so we're back at full staffing in the police department, which is good news. But another area of uh, the Department of Public Works and operations, we have 21 people who are in charge of taking care of all the streets, filling potholes, uh, picking up the leaves, um, taking care of our facilities. We were down to eight people in, uh, in September last year, and that was a huge struggle. And, the, and those eight people did heroic work to, to keep up with the work needed in the city, including uh, getting the leaves up. Um, but that's a, a situation we do not ever want to find ourselves in again, and that does require investments in our workforce. And so we do that with this budget. We also have a compensation study that's underway, and so we set aside some funds to follow the recommendations of that compensation study. Um, just one note on ARPA dollars, some key things for people to be aware of. Uh, the, the council has already allocated the largest share of the ARPA dollars towards stormwater projects. So we have $7 million going for flood improvements or flood control improvements citywide following sort of the big six projects that the stormwater task force identified. And so that will um, make it so that sort of the, the, the increases in that stormwater fee that were contemplated when we were thinking about $7 million of debt to fund those projects now has been alleviated with these federal dollars. 
Now I'm going to shift to revenues, and this is where we'll talk about assessments and uh, tax rates and that type of thing. But just first, a quick overview. Um, this is where the money comes from. So 56% uh, of the city's budget comes from real estate taxes. And of that, uh, you know, city uh, for the whole um, budget, 40% of our budget comes from residential uh, uh, real estate taxes. Then this kind of whole, this whole area of the pie of uh, real estate taxes that come from the commercial sector, plus sales taxes, meals taxes, business license. That's about another 40% of the budget that comes mainly from uh, commercial activity in the city. And the remaining 20% comes from charges for service like rec and park fees, building permit fees, and that type of thing. So uh, we do have growth in local revenues. Um, a couple of things that I will just note here, sales taxes really throughout the pandemic always did remain quite strong for the city. We had thought that they were going to decrease, but due to grocery sales taxes as well as Internet sales, uh, they remained uh, quite strong throughout the pandemic, and we have them forecast to grow another 13% next year. Meals taxes are still below pre-COVID, uh, projections, but they are coming back strongly. We cut this line item quite significantly in the first year of the pandemic when we cut our budgets overall. Um, but we have that uh, forecast to grow just about back up to pre-COVID levels, but that's a 42% increase in the budget. And business licenses are strong as well. And a part of that is because of the development activity. The contractors that are building the new buildings, they pay business license taxes and that helps the city's budget. Real estate, we're going to talk about assessments in just a moment, and obviously assessments are growing much more than 4%, uh, but with the 8.5 cent tax rate reduction, that's kind of the overall impact on uh, uh, on the budget side of real estate uh, tax revenues. So here's a, a kind of a summary of assessed value growth in the city. And um, as, the mayor, as the mayor noted right at the outset, uh, we know that they've grown significantly and most significantly in the residential sector with single family homes growing the most of, of, uh, of all of our sectors, townhouses and condos, all having strong growth as well. So overall, 13.7% um, growth in assessed value, um, which combines both new construction and market appreciation. Um, apartments also grown uh, in assessed value at uh, just 12.4%, uh, 12, 12 and then non-apartment uh, commercial, um, you know, all of our shops and stores and office buildings growing 2.6%. So the total assessed value in the city is uh, just over $5 billion this year. Uh, new construction accounts for about $34.6 million of growth, and that includes Founders Row, as well as the teardowns and rebuilds that we see out in our neighborhoods. Now, is our AV growth sort of exceptional or different from the region? Um, there is a lot of uh, similar trends throughout the region with some of the most powerful growth and in, in, uh, assessed value happening a little bit more west, Loudoun County and Prince William all in the high double digits or, or uh, you know, well above 10%. And then Fairfax County at 8.6%, um, 10.4% um, on average for residential. Uh, Closer in, Arlington um, did have more modest assessed value growth, and uh, particularly on the commercial side. So um, that's a just an overview, and and we'll be happy to answer any questions about how that process is done. But essentially, the assessed value assessment process is a mass approval, um, mass assessment process, where the assessor takes the actual sales data that are happening in the city, and then uses that data. Uh, to uh, impact um, uh, assessments on, on properties throughout the city. Um, so the current rate is $1.32 per $100 of assessed value. The proposed rate is an eight and a half cent reduction to that. Um, there is still, with that tax rate reduction, a significant impact on the average homeowner's bill, a $635 increase on average. And of course, some will be going up, some will be going down. Uh, depending on the particularities of, of your property. The um, 
the eight and a half cents represents about $731 uh, of reduction for the average homeowner in the city. Now, uh, this is the trend over time. And so you have the bars that show the actual tax rate. We were at $1.35 as we were kind of going into the lead in to the construction of Meridian High School. And, um, and we reduced the tax rate last year um, and by three and a half cents and continue that again with the eight and a half cent reduction this year. But, uh, but the average you know, tax bill is, is still going up and we, sh we show that in this chart. Uh, based on the, the dollars just from the, the prior slide. Uh, what's happening on tax rates around the region? Some of those more western localities have similar tax rate reductions. Loudoun County at 8.5% reduction, Prince William at 6.5% reduction. Um, some of the closer in jurisdictions um, do not have changes in their proposed budgets. I think their boards are still kind of looking at options, and so their decisions won't be made until late April or may for for any of these budgets or these rates that are shown um, i am proposing um, a commercial and industrial tax to help us pay for the transportation improvements and provide local dollars for matching those requirements we also will our, our metro rail obligations and metro bus obligations are always kind of out there um, and so this uh, cni tax would uh, help pay for our city obligations for those things also allow us to cover sidewalks and and uh, other transportation improvements in the city uh, this five cents on the cni would would generate about four hundred and three thousand dollars to sustain those transportation improvements um, if that's enacted by the city council it'd be a net 3.5 cent reduction for commercial taxpayers and about a negative one percent on average decrease in commercial property tax bills on average um car tax uh the other dynamic that's been happening is that blue book values have been shooting up and uh some types of vehicles you know have um value you know based on sales that are happening increases in value of 30 to 40 percent what we've budgeted is kind of a more normal increase in car tax revenues and uh and tend to work with the city council on approach to mitigate that one time kind of a, a fluke i think an oddity based on current shortages of uh, those assessed value growths um, and so fairfax county loudon county other jurisdictions are putting in a mechanism in place to deal with that and i think we'll have a similar proposal here in the city of falls church bef before those bills go out when they they are mailed typically late august or early september the stormwater fund. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm getting close to the end of the presentation, so I appreciate your patience. But um, the kind of the key thing on, that's positive on the stormwater fund is that the, the uh, flood control projects that are going through the design process right now and will be starting construction on soon, um, most of that will now be paid for through the America Rescue Plan um, dollars and uh, we're looking out for additional grants and we actually have a, a proposal before the general assembly right now for additional state dollars to help us address our stormwater needs in the city so we've got really significant relief coming uh, with with uh, federal and state dollars on the stormwater front uh, that will allow us to avoid the increases we talked about two years ago to pay for all these improvements we do have inflation however and so what i've proposed to council is a as a small 3% increase to that fee um, just to help us keep up with kind of the contract costs and things like that just for the, the normal maintenance of our stormwater pipes, which which also is pretty, pretty important uh, for mitigating flooding for homes when those pipes get stopped up if they're not being maintained properly. On the sanitary sewer side, um, also we are dealing with inflation on that side. We've not looked, we've not changed sanitary sewer fund rates since 2016. And so I'm asking for a, a consideration of a 3% increase in the sanitary sewer um, fee as well. And so that um, does wrap things up. And I want to stop now for, for questions and, and comments on the budget process. Um, again, we do have contingency built into the budget, which is the equivalent of about two cents on the tax rate. 
one million twenty thousand dollars to give the city council more flexibility uh, and, and addressing concerns that might come up both on the the spending side and on the tax side and uh, we really look forward to engaging with the community on that and um, and information on all these things is on the city's web page and uh, these links are shown here and i'll just kind of put the screen just on the next dates of the process just so you have them as you're asking questions uh, looking forward to uh, a process where we'll ultimately arrive at decisions on may 2nd which is just over a month from now um, but we have a series of public hearings and, and actions before that May 2nd uh, final consideration. So Susan, if you could help with uh, uh, facilitating questions and comments, and what we would ask people to do is there's a little uh, way to raise your hand and then we call on you and then uh, we'll take it from there. But maybe Susan, just to make sure that the people on know how to raise their hand and we can, and then we'll go from there. Sounds great. Yes, I see someone is already raised their hand which is wonderful uh you may have this hand raising feature under reactions it may be under other options you can also type in the chat if you want us to call on you pardon my cat um all right let's start with we have one hand raised uh tim stevens uh if you would like to ask your question please go ahead and unmute yourself and do so yeah good morning or good afternoon i should say thanks for all the uh for the background information uh, I'm here with Steve Rogers. Uh, we're representing the uh, Homeowners Association for Aggression Place, and we'd like to uh, highlight uh, one of the projects that's in the uh, upcoming CIP. Uh, Steve? Yeah, hi. Nice to see you. It's been a while since I've been in front of council or council staff. Um, I'm president of the Aggression Place Homeowners Association, and some of you may be aware of the traffic issues we've had at, at the light at Washington and Gresham. Uh, starting around Thanksgiving, the traffic lights no, for the fire station no longer were coordinated with the Westmoreland, leaving us uh, little or no chance to get across the street safely. There's been almost every one of my neighbors have had a near accident. So, you know, from your safety, you know, part of the city's core value, if I remember, is safety. Um, so we'd like you to look at if there's money in the budget to at least coordinate that light with the light on uh, Westmoreland and then consider, I think, it, and Tim could go into this a little bit more, but and we're on the CIP for 2026 for uh, what they call it, the uh, North Washington Planning Opportunity Area. Uh, maybe that's not funded now. We would like you to consider moving that up and funding it. And I'll turn it over to Tim who can go into a little bit better details. Yeah, the uh, North Washington POA, uh, as Steve said, it, it's in the CIP, but as of yet, uh, it's not funded. So uh, we'd be uh, very anxious to, to see efforts uh, uh, proceed on that. Basically, two pieces to that. One is the installation of a full traffic signal at uh, the Gresham Place. Uh, right now, uh, traffic is, is basically managed by an emergency signal, uh, which is on North Washington, and the signal is controlled by Arlington County. Uh, and so thus far, we've not had very good luck with uh, interacting with uh, the Arlington traffic engineers to address a problem that uh, began back, uh, back around Thanksgiving. The other part of the CIP, uh, equally important, is the installation of uh, uh, pedestrian improvements along North Washington Street. And if you have an opportunity to walk along that street, especially by the uh, Gateway Plaza office building, uh, there's just a lot of uh, things going on that make uh, uh, safety uh, an extreme problem along that, that street. Cars are, are moving typically at 40 miles an hour. Uh, they're moving right into pedestrians that are located just a few feet from uh, North Washington Street. So both of those aspects, the, the new traffic signals and the pedestrian uh, uh, safety issues are things that uh, we'd very much like to see the city uh, accelerate uh, as part of this North Washington POA. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Tim and, and Steve. And um, I appreciate the background on that signal. It is a frustrating situation. I know we've been trying to work that with Arlington County and it, uh, uh, I'll follow up with you after this meeting just to see what, uh, what you're experiencing out there right now. 
Could I ask Cindy just to uh, speak to that North Washington Street project in terms of where it is in the queue? I know that's one of our NVTA funded projects. Sure, uh, thank you. And um, yeah, it is a grant application we submitted to NVTA is going through the review process now and we'll know uh, by June if it's funded. Um, we submitted in the past and it ranked two, but it scored high, so we're optimistic. But it is in the out years, um, as um, Mr. Stevens noted. So uh, we're looking at the um, FY26. So, um, and it's a $22 million full project. Of course, the signal is a smaller part. So we'll, we'll take a note of the comments and have to see if there's funding or other opportunity to um, move any part of it forward at minimum, certainly keep working, as Mr. Fields said, to the signal timing issue. That's the immediate safety issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here for for raising that that concern. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat, Wyatt, if you don't mind my reading those aloud. Um, uh, Tina is asking, when will this new tax rate apply? Is it going to apply to this upcoming June payment um, or December payment or next June? When does that new rate take effect? That's one question from her and we have another one after that. So the new assessments and the new rate would it take effect in the December bill. So you would not see either of those show up in the June bill. Your June bill would be just what your December one was. Uh, so six months ahead from now is kind of what we're talking about. Uh, nine months ahead from now is what we're talking about. All right, Tina's giving a thumbs up on that. Thumbs but that's, up, exactly. <laughs> that's that's uh, the other stage. question. Her other question is about the General Assembly. Are there any good things coming out of it? Um, because she has heard that there aren't many good things coming from it. Cindy, would you? Cindy uh, serves as our legislative uh, person who really keeps an eye on the General Assembly, along with Councilmember Dave Snyder and uh, Councilmember Phil Dunklin on the Legislative Committee. But it's something that the whole council pays a whole, very close attention to. Cindy, give us the latest. Thank you, Mr. Shields. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of things that aren't good as they go through the budget looking at changing tax law, which has positive components of it, but we could significantly lose revenue. So we're waiting for the state budget, which we don't have yet. And the governors call the General Assembly back into session on Monday, and hopefully then they'll start negotiating so we have a state budget. Some of the things that Mr. Shields was uh, referring to that are the good things. Uh, one is the $4 million that our Senator, Senator Sassloff put in for stormwater and it's still in the budget, but until we have a budget, it's not firm yet, but that's positive. We are also seeing some positive support and acknowledgement of the need to fund um, local police departments. Um, sheriffs and some of our constitutional officers so that they're paying for the positions that should be state funded. So those are just a few examples. Um, all of it, however, depends on getting the final budget by the from the General Assembly. Great. All right, so our next question is a hand raised from James. James, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, hi, uh, uh, my name is James Schoenberger and uh, I have a question on assessments and corresponding taxes. Uh, the assessment that uh, we received went up 23%. Uh, and even with the reduction proposed by Mr. Shields, uh, the actual taxes paid would go up 15%. So my question is, does the city have it within its power to cap the percentage increase that actual taxes would go up in a particular year? Or does that say instead of, in our case, instead of the 15%, could they cap the tax increase, say at 10% for across the board? No one would have to go, no one would go up more than 10% as an example. Or does something like that have to go through the state legislature? 
Yeah, so the sh quick answer is something like that does not exist on state law right now, so it would have to go through the state legislature. What the state law does state is that uh, local governments are obligated to assess based on fair market value, and then there's uniform, you know, everyone pays the same rate accordingly. And uh, so that's the state of, uh, of law right now. Uh, would this be a good idea to have a cap like this? So the General Assembly has looked at caps in the past, and usually, you know, the last time that this was a big discussion was in that 2003 through 2007 time frame. If you'll recall, that that was a period where we had multiple years of double-digit uh, assessment increases. And what, when you have that type of dynamism in the market, what I think happens is that it's, it's sort of like it's not all properties are affected the same way. And um, and so you get these, you know, a lot of tension out in the community because things are changing quickly. Um, so that um, I will say that, you know, that uniform taxing principle is actually in the Virginia Constitution is my understanding. So, for instance, we have tax relief which is for seniors, veterans, and the disabled. And the reason we have that is because those are laid out in the Constitution that those are the only people, that only groups that you can have non-uniform taxation for. Um, so uh, that, that's the kind of my understanding of the current state of, of state law and, and that we operate under. Okay, I, I appreciate that, but it's you know it seems to me it, I understand you'd have to get the legislature to do this, but it seems to me if you had a cap of say ten percent, uh, the following year it would probably catch up uh, because uh, it would be made up for that particular property in the next year, most likely. But uh, enough said. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. All right, I see. Um, Michael has his hand raised next, and then after him, Sandy. So, Michael, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your ask your question? Yes, thank you. I assume it's Michael Traverman. Michael's a popular yes. name. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I have a uh, well. First of all, thanks very much uh, to the staff and everyone for taking the time to do this. And uh, the uh, you know this whole process is uh, I'm sure quite time consuming and uh, full, filled with stress. So, <laughs> appreciate all that good effort. Um, I have a number of questions um, and comments uh, really with an environmental focus, environmental sustainability, which uh, some of you folks know I serve on a couple of commissions or a commission or a subcommittee that have to deal with that. So I think a lot about that. Uh, the, the, fir the first thing was uh, I was pleased to see that um, there was an environmental lens that applied to the CIP. And I, I, I kind of, that's a, a really good first step to... Um, I'll call it implementing a whole of government approach to uh, you know that guides the city toward uh, you know its response to the climate crisis and achieving our greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, I know it was the first year doing that. Um, you know I don't believe it actually had any impact on anything in the CIP, um, but you know hopefully it'll uh, you know it'll you know have a, have a good second year and years going forward. I'd also encourage that uh, to be used for the budget, not just the CIP mm -hmm. um, in future years. So that, that'll be something uh, to consider. Um, and then I have a few comments just on, on the budget and the CIP, if I could. Um, with regard to the budget, I saw on page 99, through 101 of the of the budget, which is 101 through 103 on the PDF, that the deliverables in 23 include uh, uh, working with uh, COG contractors for a uh, community for two climate and energy plans. One's for the community, the other's for the schools and the government itself, government mm -hmm. operations. And you know th those are two really important plans that need to be completed because without a plan we can't really begin to implement specific steps to confront the climate crisis and to achieve our greenhouse greenhouse gas goal emissions 
reductions. So those items need to move forward because without a plan, yeah, I, I, as I understand, you can't take specific actions. So um, those are really important. But when I look in the in in the budget, uh, I don't see I see the deliverables for those two plans, uh, but I don't see any money to do it. So I'm kind of curious how we can deliver those two things without any funding. I mean, maybe maybe the funding's there and I can't find it somewhere in, in the budget. But, you know, that, so that's question one. So if you could, somebody could speak to that, that'd be terrific. And then I have a couple more if you don't mind. Thank sure. You. And uh, so uh, Ms. Bawa might want to jump in as well, but uh, Ms. Bawa is our chief uh, financial officer or budget director. Um, but so in the Dece in December this past year, the city council did make an allocation of the first use of the America Rescue Plan dollars, as well as spent some rededicated some underspending from the prior year. So in December, the council did fund the development of the community energy plan that you're referring to. Um, and we have not built into this budget funding for the government operations spending plan, but that will be kind of a one time expense. So my thinking on that had been less finish the community energy plan, uh, work through um, that process, and then we will identify dollars to take the next step, which is to focus on the school's energy plan and the general government's energy plan. So that may not be the, the best solution, but that's the solution that that I, I was offering. And Ms. Ba Ms. Bawa, is there anything that I said wrong or any other dollars on those two studies anyway that I missed? Uh, no, you're right on it. Well, we funded, I just wanted to put the figure out there, 125000 for the climate mitigation energy plan that was included in the year-end budget amendment. Right. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. I, I just, you know, I, I get it. It's, you know, you, you want to do one before you do the other. It seems to make a lot of sense. Um, you know, the sooner the better. But I did see that it was the 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 second one, the the city you know, operations and schools was in it was listed as a deliverable for this year. And I wasn't quite sure how you can deliver something without funding. You know, my, I'm, I'm kind of an old school kind of guy that says nothing really, nothing happens unless you fund it. <laughs> so there you go. You know, so two points, one, fund it, two, let's get it done as quickly as possible um, in a thoughtful manner, obviously. I, I think that's a, a good comment and it's, when we say it's a deliver deliverable, it's on our work plan, but you're correct. I, I've not put money in the 23 budget as of today uh, for the, for that second step. Right. Gotcha. OK, um, uh, if can I can I go through a couple more more items quickly, um, if that's OK, or do you want to I can circle back after somebody else goes. Uh, you, you, why, why don't we go and, and then we'll uh, call on Ms. Tarpinian after after you're done. Okay. Uh, second is uh, okay. So this is uh, the uh, thank you the the uh, community center HVAC replacement, which is in the CIP. Um, you know, I uh, I believe I read something that it's going to continue to be a uh, gas fired uh, HVAC system, uh, or at least that that was the initial take on it. But you know, maybe it could be. You know, it was a preliminary. Uh, uh, view of what that design might be. But uh, what I'd like to highlight is uh, a few things. Chapter five of the uh, comprehensive plan um, affirms that the city is going to strive to be a leader in environmental sustainability. Um, one of the uh, climate, air, and energy strategies in chapter five is to reduce the use of fossil fuels for public facilities. And uh, thirdly, that the you know, the, the city, um, and I participate in this uh, in the ESC, we spent a lot of time encouraging our private sector developers who, who are going through the special exception process to, uh, to you know, focus on eliminating fossil fuels from their uh, buildings and HVAC is a big part of that. And, and frankly, in, in the most recent ones, they've been really uh, pretty good at focusing on that. And that have all happened because we modified the special exception criteria, the secondary ones last year. 
and uh, required, uh, you know, uh, uh, an improvement in energy efficiency to be part of, of uh, you know, one of the criteria. So a reduction in in their energy in their energy uh, use. So, um, you know, I, I'd encourage the city strongly encourage the city on that HVAC replacement um, if it's feasible. You know, I, I get it; these things are complicated to use electric heat pump technology uh, to do that as opposed to. Uh, going forward with natural gas, I hate to call it natural gas, it's, it's a marketing term, it's really fossil gas. Um, anyway, to, um, you know, to, to, you know this, is, this is how it's going to stick around for 25 years and we're never going to make progress on our goals and our vision if we keep putting fossil fuels in our buildings. So that's, that's that point and, you know, something to consider. I'm sure you will consider it. Not sure it needs a response, but if you'd like to, you know. Um, yeah, I think what we should, uh, I think the takeaway from this is uh, we will consider it. And um, I see that Danny Schlitt is on the call. I don't know if we, it might be something just to follow up with after this meeting, but you're, you're absolutely right with the Founders Road project that was uh, approved on Monday. That was a big part of the, uh, the, the final round of voluntary concessions that all the residential units would be. Uh, not having uh, not, uh, fossil gas <laughs> uh, service, and um, and so that's uh, the direction we're we're uh, trying to move in. Danny, I don't know if you have anything additional to say on that, or something we'll just follow up on after this meeting. Wyatt, this is Cindy, and I'll just it's jump me. in. Uh, Public Works has been the lead on that, so I recommend we follow up. But we did provide a written response to the Planning Commission. So we can expand upon that. Um, it is early in the design. They're looking at most definitely the energy efficiency, things consistent with the comp plan. And this will also include replacing some of the LED lights. So there's other pieces. Uh, the only piece that would need to stay at this point, uh, natural gas or fossil gas, uh, would probably be the emergency generator because it serves as our emergency shelter in bad weather and storms. Michael, you got uh, muted somehow. It just gets back to that whole environmental lens that we need to apply across the entirety of government where, you know, we, you know, I, I get, you know, no one's really used to thinking about these kind of things or, you know, not, not that many people. And we need to prioritize that um, if we're going to be true to uh, what we say, you know, we have to, we have to take actions that match our words going forward. Um, so um, anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry for that lecture, but that's kind of, you know. Uh, we definitely concur and we'll take those comments back um, as we work with Public Works, who will, of course, coordinate with Rex and Park. We've got to make sure the community yeah. center is operational. Let's all work Thank together. You. I think that's a great idea. Yep. And uh, can I get my, my last, my last question is one why it knows I always talk about. It's uh, more a resiliency issue, which is the stormwater infrastructure uh, that we have going into um, uh, uh, well, there's a huge amount of the CIP and, you know, I also know there's uh, a ton going on up in, up at West Falls and, um, and I have some familiarity with uh, stormwater and, uh, but I'm not a stormwater engineer and I, I know enough to get myself in a lot of trouble, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of rain that is anticipated and well, not, I mean, there've been scientific studies that show that, you know, there's really a, a 20%, there's 20% more rainfall, uh, you know, over the design storms that are, you know, officially in the NOAA Atlas and this and that. And, and the question is, on all the stormwater infrastructure, the gray infrastructure that's going in, in the city, you know, is it, is it being, I'm going to, I would hate to say future proof, because it's really current proofed. It needs to be current proofed and future proofed. And I don't know if we're doing that. And I've asked that question. Um, and uh, you know, I hate to I hate to design for a a five year storm or a seven year storm when it you know you know the, the you know <laughs> you get the idea that you know. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to. I know we have money available to us from ARPA, and we need to spend it. And you know, there there's all kind of criteria, but 
you know, I don't want to waste taxpayers' money by building stormwater infrastructure that's uh, too small from day one. That would be a shame. Not a good use of taxpayer money. Um, so, but I don't know the answer if it is or it isn't. So, anyway, it's something I would encourage you to look into and, and be thoughtful about. Thank you. And uh, those that's the end of my questions, but you can respond to that. Thank you. Sure. And, and I just look up. Respond to the principle. We totally agree. We do not want to use taxpayer dollars for, you know, short-term solutions that are going to be, um, you know, overtaken by events so you know quickly. And that the those standards are really particularly important on the detention side uh, to make sure that we are hold, you know, in those projects where we're holding water back, that we have those sized, uh, you know, for for the rain events we actually get in the city, and. Um, and then on pipe expansion, the only sort of additional point I'll make on that is that we do have to be mindful of the people downstream. We might be doing a wonderful thing to unclog a situation at point A. We just have to be very mindful of what's happening downstream. And if that those facilities are, are built to hold a certain flow rate, we don't want to put, you know, all of a sudden accelerate a whole bunch of new water onto those, the, those folks downstream. I know the engineers are always keeping an eye on that as well. But uh, I think your principle is well stated. Thank you. All right, Sandy, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, and then I think after this, uh, Cindy is going to uh, present about the CIP. Well, this was a great lead in for my question because another solution to keeping so much water running into our pipes and downstream is to try to incentivize homeowners to keep their water on their property. So maybe Cindy's going to talk about this with this huge amount of money that we now have available for stormwater mitigation. I wonder how much, if any, is being uh, set aside to incentivize homeowners to do more on their own properties through rain barrels, through getting rid of lawn and planting a kind of a conservation landscape with plants that have much, much deeper root systems that really will not only help water percolate right on the property, but it cleans the water as well. And so you know, you're talking now about quantity as well as quality of water. Um, it's, it's a process that will take education, and there are a lot of us in the community who are working toward educating people a little bit more about the importance of this, but it also takes some incentive because sometimes these projects can get expensive. We have the rain barrel. We have the rain barrel and the rain garden program through Vepus right now, but this is not enough, in my opinion. And so I'm just wondering if, in this budget now, and maybe with the CIP that you're going to talk about, Cindy, can you can you give me any encouragement that the the city is looking uh, at at this as a a, a sustainable, longer term solution for starting to c control our stormwater. Thank you. Maybe Cindy's going to uh, talk about the CIP and stormwater is a big important part of the CIP and and Sandy kind of frankly what most of those investments are for investments in the public right of way or where we have easements right now for stormwater infrastructure and it is you know the CIP is not geared towards investments uh, that would be happening, you know, at the home by home uh, level, uh, but that's it's an important policy area that you've raised in the past and uh, using the stormwater fee as an incentive uh, to do those types of things. And without going into a long digression on this, sort of that there are two sort of different types of challenges we're trying to face, and and the one on the CIP side is to deal with these major rain events where we're talking about an inch of rain every 20 minutes, you know, three inches of rain in an hour. Those are the events where we've had significant damage and, and, and uh, property damage. 
and in those types of rain events, um, it you know those are pretty capital intensive uh, efforts to try to address those types of events. The um, home by home types of projects, you know, those types of rain events overwhelm any home facility, and they they kind of overwhelm everything at, as a matter of fact. But they also quickly overwhelm the the smaller uh, dispersed green infrastructure, and um, and so it's. But they are very important for water quality, and they're very important for that kind of repeated smaller scale storm, which we also get in the city. Um, you know, the sort of the nuisance flooding uh, that that can be addressed very effectively to, through the types of programs if they're really rolled out and embraced citywide. Uh, so there's a couple comments on that, but I I know Cindy's going to be kind of mostly uh, doing an introduction to um, a film that we have for the CIP. So we have run over time, so I might just note, let me turn it over to Cindy to introduce uh, the, the CIP film. But before I do that, Sandy, did I um, answer your question? Probably not. Uh, very satisfactorily, but uh, but let me just circle back with you before Cindy takes it away. Uh, yeah, I believe that the pipes are important. I totally get that. Um, I just I just wonder how the city can start figuring out the homeowner to homeowner side of it as well. And and uh, I would look forward to continuing to talk about this with anybody who has any good ideas. OK, well, thank you for that. And thank you for your advocacy for that. And, um, you know, one piece of good news is that the Lincoln Avenue project is intending to do stormwater with green infrastructure and uh, detention and uh, sort of biophilic approaches to stormwater on that Lincoln project. But uh, that might be a segue to Cindy. And uh, <laughs> and uh, so let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Shields, and and I do appreciate the comments on the CIP and the environmental focus. Is if it doesn't totally fit into the CIP, it does start the the conversation and the commitment to Chapter Five of the Comp Plan for for sure and our work in stormwater, et cetera, and HVAC. So um, just want to do a quick highlight today, and as Mr. Shields says, we have a, a six minute video that gives you a good overview. One of the things I want to flag is that next Monday, Council's work session, uh, April 4th at 7.30, the CIP is the sort of the big budget discussion we'll have. So we'll go into much more detail on some of these projects and so forth at that time. Um, the CIP is designed to be transformative. So as Mr. Shields talks about our core basic services and our transformative, the CIP is the, the instrument, the tool that can help execute the vision and a lot of the um, comp plan and area plans that are our policy making wise. So that's what it's set up to be. Our six year CIP is robust. It's about $120 million. That represents over 65 projects when you think about facilities, cyber, public safety, transportation, stormwater and sanitary sewer. Um, so it is a key planning document for sure. Um, and with that, the um, about 68 million of that 120 million is grant funded. So we're way over half using grant dollars. Those are federal and state. And that brings some of the complexities on how we can use the funding. So Sandy, your ideas about working with private individuals incentivize is good, but this funding source happens to be federal and it does water quality and quantity, but you can't do individual. So those little wonderful nuances that staff need to work through. That said, the idea is stimulate others and how can we do it like we've done with VPIS grants to them so they can work with individuals. Um, so I do want to encourage um, either attending and watching the April 4th work session, which will be virtual, um, checking the recording out afterwards and the full CIP, um, the full document is on the website and that was in the slide deck that Mr. Shields ended with and the video we're about to show also uh, shows it. So I appreciate the comments today and this is just as the budget is just starting, this is the CIP start with council. The Planning Commission did do a full review of it some last fall and through March, and the Planning Commission did approve and recommend the CIP um, as presented in the city manager's um, 
proposed budget. They did highlight some additional things to make sure we continue to look at in the future, the environmental things, the sustainability and resiliency that uh, you all have referenced, as well as things like affordable housing. Um, so with that, Susan, if I could ask you to uh, play the video, that would be great. It's a good overview lead in, and then we'll look forward to more detailed conversations at town halls and the council work session. You got it. As, as we're queuing it up, we do recognize we've probably gone over a little bit of time, so if people have other obligations. We understand that, but I think this is this video is quite a good explanation of, of the CIP process, so um, thank you for queuing it up. The Capital Improvements Program, or CIP, is the process with which the City of Falls Church identifies capital needs of the community and indicates how these needs will be funded over a six-year period. The CIP allows citizens to make substantive changes to their community. It prioritizes things like walkability, public safety, physical and mental health, and creating a sense of community for the citizens of Falls Church. The Planning Commission, School Board, and City Council all play key roles in the CIP process here in Falls Church. The School Board approves their own CIP projects, which are then added into the full CIP that is presented to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission reviews and makes recommendations to the City Council for the six-year CIP that will be included in the City Manager's budget proposal. The City Council has final authority to approve all projects and funding. The City views every project through an equity lens and an environmental impact lens in order to make sure the projects undertaken are equitable for all and sustainable for the future. The successful completion of Meridian High School, Mary Riley Stiles Public Library, and City Hall mark three once-in-a-generation scale projects, all of which were conceived and developed through the city's six-year capital improvements program. Capital planning can now focus on four key areas of the CIP. Transportation, walkers, cyclists, persons with disabilities, public transportation, as well as automobile traffic. Parks, preserve natural areas and meet the recreational needs of a growing population. Facilities, ensure all city buildings are welcoming, healthy, and functional places for work and civic life. Public utilities, stormwater, reduce the frequency of flooding and promote healthy streams. Sanitary sewer, expand capacity to meet a growing population. Some recent accomplishments of the capital planning process include the Meridian High School project, which was completed in 2021 on time and on budget. The building is net zero ready and sustainable for generations to come. The Mary Riley Stiles Public Library was completed on time and on budget, is LEED Silver certified, and is thriving more than ever with increased visitors and circulation. Big Chimneys Park was updated with new ADA accessible playground equipment and major new stormwater infrastructure, which removed site flooding that precluded kids' ability to play safely. Neighborhood traffic calming has been a priority in the city. Nine neighborhood traffic calming projects were completed last year, decreasing speeding and increasing pedestrian safety. Of the projects that are currently in design, the Annandale and Maple Roundabout is on schedule with an advertised completion date of March 1, 2023. On Broad Street, Hawk signals or high intensity activated crosswalks are being installed with a projected completion date of April 7, 2022. The WNOD road crossings are expected to start construction in spring of 2024 and the WNOD Dual Trails project was substantially completed in early October of 2021. The Oak Street Bridge is on schedule for construction to start in the summer of 2022 with VDOT managing construction. And the Fellows Park planning process is underway to create a brand new park with amenities such as benches, tables and pathways, a community garden, a natural play area with a mud table, tires, lumber, pots and pans, and boulders and logs, a small space for use by Recreation and Parks Department, and the public schools for environmental education, and more. The four areas of focus in the CIP are transportation, parks, facilities, and public utilities. For the full six-year CIP, the total cost will be $114,000,000. 
$10,734, with a majority of the funding coming from grants. Over those six years, $79,092,530 will go towards transportation, $5,277,500 for parks, $8,287,572 for facilities, and $21,353,132 will go towards stormwater and sanitary sewer. For FY23, the total cost will be $18,988,607, with $6,287,278 for transportation, $150,000 for parks, $3,812,572 for facilities, and $8,738,757 for stormwater and sanitary sewer. After undertaking the big three projects of Meridian High School, Mary Riley Stiles Public Library, and City Hall, avoidance of new debt is a priority, and the city will rely on grants and pay-go for funding. Going forward, the Planning Commission has recommended that future CIPs include programming and funding for the preservation of existing and expansion of new affordable housing consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan vision and housing chapter, procurement and installation of new renewable energy facilities consistent with chapter five of the comprehensive plan, protected bike lanes consistent with mobility for all modes, expansion of efforts to remove obstacles in sidewalks such as utility poles, and green infrastructure to control flooding from increasingly intense storms guided by a climate resilience plan. The projects within the CIP help the City of Falls Church address the needs of the community in order to create an equitable, sustainable future. For more information, please visit fallschurchva.gov slash CIP. Thank you, Susan, for queuing that up. And Mr. Shields, I'll pass the baton back to you for any wrap-ups by you or council. Well, I want to, uh, Cindy, thank you. And I want to thank Michael uh, Tempain, who is with the Falls Church Cable Station up there at the high school, who uh, put that film together. So a uh, great job. And I appreciate everybody uh, sticking around to to tune into it. Hopefully it was useful and informative. So let's open it back up for questions or comments. And I'll just note that the city council is going to be rolling up its sleeves on Monday night uh, to really dig into the CIP as as well as the other elements of the budget. But the, our focus on Monday will be with the CIP. There we go. There's a hand raised. Uh, Michael, would you like to ask uh, another question? Please do. Um, yeah, I, no, I have no questions other than I, I endorse the uh, tail end of that video um, that the Planning Commission um, put forward about the bike lanes and the uh, renewable energy and, it, and the green stormwater infrastructure. So the, those ideas have, have my complete support. And thank you very much for including them. That was great. Great, and I think Tina made a comment that she likes the video, so thanks for that. We appreciate that. It's, it's fun to try new things, <laughs> so thanks for that feedback. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing any other hands raised, and I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay, well, um, everybody, thank you very much for joining us at this noon town hall meeting. Um, Hopefully the virtual format was convenient to people and uh, we will uh, have our next one on Thursday, April 21st at 7 p.m. And uh, uh, those I hope everybody joins us for that. I do before we break, I do want to just note that um, uh, we've had some uh, council members join since the very beginning when the mayor made his introductory comments. So I just want to um, thank uh, council member Dave Snyder, council member Caroline Leon, Councilmember Letty Hardy for also joining in on this town hall meeting and uh, hearing the comments and, and uh, commentary uh, and questions from uh, from the public. Um, 
everybody have a great and safe afternoon and i look forward to further engagement with you as we go through the next steps in the process stay safe